My name is Katie Gibbs. I am a founding partner and head of consulting at Emergence Partners. And we are a consultancy that's dedicated to achieving profound transformation with new and emerging technologies. So I'm really excited to be sharing my talk today on achieving profound transformation with machine learning. Organizations are becoming increasingly risk averse when it comes to adopting this technology in part due to the fact that machine learning has had a really bad rap in the press recently and understandably so. So I'm excited to share my top tips on how to avoid these common pitfalls and how to achieve success with your machine learning projects um, and delivering value in the longer term of machine learning. Please do click on the engage tab and I look forward to responding to your questions throughout this talk. So there was a bit of a clue in the title of my talk on the Big Data London website uh, because it was entitled Mind the Gap, Uniting Technical and Business Expertise to Deliver Profound Transformation Machine Learning. So this is a common theme that I'm going to keep returning to throughout this talk. Uh, please do follow myself at Emergence on Twitter. We would love to um, engage in a dialogue on there as well. So I wanted to start by reflecting on the adoption of AI and machine learning um, within organizations to date. And I think it is worth reflecting on the fact that 42% of executives believe that AI will be of critical importance within the next two years. And 58% of companies have adopted machine learning and that's growing by at least 5% year on year. So clearly, organizations are recognizing the strategic imperative of adopting artificial intelligence. Yet, although AI implementation grew a whopping 270% in the last four years, 85% of AI projects fail. So there's a very high risk of failure when setting out on your AI journey. And when things go wrong, the stakes can be incredibly high. So I wanted to take a look at a few examples. Um, they are all from the month of August. So it really highlights that when one thing goes wrong with machine learning and the press flags it, they will keep flagging any ongoing mistakes. And you always have this domino effect where it feels like you can't do anything right. Um, and rightly so, the press are calling out um, some of these examples. So let's take a look at some of them. The first one that I wanted to share is the Home Office uh, had to scrap an immigration algorithm that was accused of being racist. It was described as speedy boarding for white people and a legal challenge was actually mounted, um, but the algorithm was scrapped before they could go to court. And they're now in the process of redesigning this algorithm, which is an interesting concept because they're redesigning it now that they've got this poor reputation for the algorithm and users mistrust it. So it'll be interesting to see how they allay user concerns when they relaunch it and how they ensure that they've learned from what went wrong last time. And this is quite a high profile example, but it was nothing compared to what happened um, with the A-level algorithm, uh, A-level results algorithm. So essentially, um, what happened was that, of course, pupils couldn't sit to their exams due to COVID. So teachers provided predicted grades and the Department of Education decided to use an algorithm that um, predicted grades based on historical data, performance of the school, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a disaster. Um, most, most pupils had their results downgraded by at least one or two grades. And the algorithm was found to be biased. So that's people who went to school in a lower income area had their um, results downgraded even further. So the algorithm was embodying some of the inherent bias that was in the data set that it was trained on. And this had real lasting consequences. So of course the pupils were distraught because it was a really stressful environment and they didn't get the results that they hoped for. Teachers were disengaged because they provided their predicted grades and they weren't used in conjunction with the algorithm. The, out the outcome of the algorithm was just taken at face value. And one interesting consequence that wasn't foreseen 
was that universities really struggled to cope with the amount of queries that they received because they were trying to deal with so many pupils that didn't receive their expected results um, and were trying to ensure that they could allocate all their places. And then a week later, the government did a U-turn and reverted to using the teacher's predicted grades, which I imagine frustrated teachers, but it made it even more difficult for universities because they were trying to then allocate places to people who did meet the grades, but hadn't the week before, they might have given that place away. So there was a, a lot of confusion and it was a really, um, a really terrible example of how not to deploy an algorithm and then just one week later it was announced that councils are scrapping the use of algorithms in benefit and welfare decisions uh, because they wrongly identified low risk claims as high risk so councils decided to scrap the algorithm and resume the manual process however this was more time consuming of slowing down people's cl claims and they weren't being very open about why it was taking more time until it hit headlines so I wanted to flag these examples because the public sector has been particularly hard hit by AI disasters just over summer. And it was a missed opportunity. They had a real opportunity to showcase the value that AI can bring in delivering efficiencies and a fantastic user experience. And they completely missed the mark. But it's not just them. It's also some of the leaders in the tech space. So MIT hit headlines um, a couple of months ago because they had to take offline a massive and highly cited data set that was widely used to train AI systems because it was teaching AI to use racist and misogynistic terms to describe people. Um, so MIT are struggling and then not long afterwards, Google had to apologize when it was found that its vision AI produced racist results. So the image of a hand holding a temperature gun was labeled differently depending on the skin color of the person holding it. So even leaders in the tech space haven't quite got this right and it has real ethical implications and it's just contributing to all this distrust in the public domain when it comes to AI, particularly algorithms. So when I reflect on why this happened, what went wrong, there are some key factors at play. And it starts with an ethically dubious data set that inherently has bias within it, combined with a lack of human oversight, which then results in users feeling overlooked, and I'm sure we can all agree a pretty terrible user experience, and then results in PR disasters. And what I've been thinking about why this is and why organizations are getting this so wrong for me, one of the key points is that there's far too much focus on ethical frameworks. Ethical frameworks are a great starting point, but there's not enough consideration on the specifics of AI design. And the EU um, ethics guidelines are a perfect example of this. It's a high level expert group. So they're admitting that they can only do this from a high level perspective and it's in draft. And it's because the AI marketplace is so huge and there's so many things to take into consideration it's not possible to produce a definitive guide on delivering ethical AI there is, there's just too much at play however there's not enough consideration for the specifics of AI design a lot of these ethical guidelines have core principles um, such as transparency and fairness but it doesn't tell you how to achieve that and it's, it's essentially AI design has to go deeper than compliance or high value principles. It has to go to the very root of your company, your values and the industry in which you operate if you're going to be successful. So I wanted to share my top tips on how to avoid uh, some of these pitfalls because it's not enough just to fight fires as and when these issues occur. These were missed opportunities and if done right, they would have been great examples of how to deliver value of machine learning. And I think the first thing to note is taking a human centric approach to developing AI is inherently more ethical because you're having more human oversight and more human engagement throughout the entire process. So I'd like to start by outlining the diversity of the skills that I think goes into the ideal machine learning team. And we start with a data scientist. And of course, every organization will have data scientists and they probably focus predominantly on the data scientist when they're thinking about the makeup of their ML team. And the data scientist is responsible for developing the ML algorithm, be that 
predictive analytics or natural language processing. And best practice normally means uh, that there'll be an ML engineer setting, sitting alongside them. So they'll be responsible for developing the CICD pipelines and product, productionizing the algorithms so that you can take it into live. And the third role is a data governor, and this is often overlooked, but the data governor is responsible for ensuring appropriate and compliant use of data and takes ownership for master data management, which is a really key role when you think about the bias um, within the data set that we just explored as part of those examples. So these are the key roles from a technical expertise perspective, and there are others as well, but these are the key ones I'd like to focus on. But I also think that the softer skills are often overlooked when it comes to a machine learning team. So I always make an argument for including a product owner in an ML team. So they really define what the vision is for the project and they align that to business objectives. And as a result, they'll therefore maximize the business value that you can get from your machine learning algorithms. But most importantly, the product owner oversees end-to-end -end development. So they will ensure that the team are adhering to best practices, that they're taking into consideration the ethical principles all the way through. And the second role, which I think is probably the most important one um, alongside the data scientist, is a service designer. So the service designer is responsible for embedding user-centric design. And what they do is they explore the end-to-end -end user journeys for multiple personas, multiple types of users, so that they can assess the user impact, which means that they can mitigate the worst case scenarios. They can mitigate um, what would happen if your algorithm did become biased because they're already establishing what good looks like for each of your users. So these are the human and business skills that I think very much needs to go hand in hand with the technical skills that you have within your ML team. Um, but it's not just about the diversity of skills. Of course, it's also about the diversity of the team itself, which is incredibly important. And it's only highlighted by the fact that Facebook's AI team is 85% male. Google's AI team is 90% male. I mean, it's pretty depressing when you look at these stats because AI is such a male dominated industry and it's a very white industry as well. And one example of where having this male dominated team at Google has had a real life impact on its output is that Google's word embedding model began projecting gender biases into Google Translate a couple of years ago. So it was assuming that CEOs and engineers were male and this was prevalent. So it was a real issue and it highlights the importance of having critical people and a more diverse set of people looking at this earlier on in the process. And it's not just about having a diverse team in terms of ticking the box. Having a diverse team will inherently reduce your risk of bias. And they'll do this by testing the results against diverse sets of scenarios. So I talked around how a service designer looks at different personas, looks at different scenarios. They don't just look at the happy path that the data science would tend to look at in order to meet the acceptance criteria. They'll think about what would happen if this went wrong and how could we get that user back onto a happy path as quickly as possible. So in line with this, they will mitigate the edge cases. They'll really think about how to overlay human expertise and human oversight in order to provide the optimal experience for your users. And crucially, they will consider your users from day one. So they'll really think about how it's delivering value, how it's gonna improve their experience. I think one of the most important things about having business skills and human skills within that ML team is that they will ensure that the acceptance criteria goes beyond the accuracy of the algorithm and goes beyond designing it for typically white male users. So think about all the different user groups and what the impact will be if one of them is discriminated against and how you can avoid that from happening. And lastly, Having diverse team means you've got extra sets of eyes to take a look at the data sets and check for bias because they're looking for it, because they are more representative of the data set and the people that you want to serve. So 
talking of investigating your data set for bias, I wanted to talk around the three key biases to be wary of. So when you have this diverse team and you're looking at your data, these are the three things to really look out for. And the first is exclusion bias. So exclusion bias happens as a result of excluding some features from a data set, usually under the umbrella of cleaning our data. I think we've all experienced this, um, but it's absolutely crucial that you investigate the features that you're considering discarding and you do sufficient analysis on them up front. And one of the best ways of doing that is having a fresh pair of eyes to review the features and provide a second opinion as to whether you should discard them or not. And this is where the product owner role can really come into play because they can provide a business insights into justification for including those features if, if needed. The second uh, bias to be aware of is sample bias. And sample bias is what happens when the collected data of a data set that you trained your algorithm on doesn't accurately represent the environment that the program's expected to run in. Now, don't get me wrong, I completely appreciate that there is no algorithm in the world that can be trained on an entire universe of data. That is not possible. But rather what I'm saying is that you need to have a subset of data that's been very carefully chosen. You need to cover all the cases that you expect your model to be exposed to. And you can do this by examining the domain of each feature and ensuring that you've got balanced and evenly distributed data covering all those domains. And this is the, so I think sample bias is the real, um, the, the real trigger for having this diverse team because it highlights you can't rely on your data to be diverse. You need your team to point out when it isn't and your team will only do that if it is more diverse and it's more representative of the people that are going to be affected by the algorithm. Then thirdly, we have prejudice bias and prejudice bias happens as a result of cultural influences or stereotypes. So it's essentially when a model applies the same stereotyping that exists in real life due to the prejudice data that it's fed. And it can be addressed by ignoring the statistical relationship between gender, race, postcode. However, the main way of mitigating it is by exposing the algorithm to a more even-handed distribution of examples. So clearly unconscious bias can creep in when the training data is unrepresentative of the wider world or through data that's inherently biased in the first place. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be using machine learning on that data, because what's interesting is actually if you flip this round and you have the right parameters in place, machine learning can actually be used as a tool to uncover the bias in your data sets, to uncover any risk um, before you go live with your algorithm. And it can be, become a crucial element of your supervised learning process. And of course, that supervised learning process has to go beyond go live. It has to be consistent process to ensure you're always looking out for flags and potential risks. So I've talked a lot around the skills and the team and the impact that has and part of that is not overlooking the human expertise because if you do overlook human expertise within your organization it is a risk to your business and I appreciate most organizations do consider AI as a means of reducing their cost to serve I mean, focus less on value creation. However, if you just focus on implementing AI in order to reduce headcount, this can have a real impact in your organization because it can lead to losing the business knowledge and skills that you need in order to uh, provide oversight over your uh, algorithms. It can impact the company culture. If you're cutting heads, you're likely to see an exodus and employees are kind of losing their colleagues and it will impact the atmospheres and their drivers to come into work. And it can also have a negative brand perception if um, news of how you're adopting technology in this very, um, this incredibly tech-centric way, it will get out to the media. And as we've seen, it, it, can, cause, it can create headlines. So it's worth taking these into consideration. And there's a stat that I find particularly insightful when considering the role of humans in AI because 65% of employees are likely to leave if their employer is being negatively portrayed in the news or social media. And 86% 86 of, 86 of prospective employees will not continue to apply for a job at a company that has a bad reputation with former employees. So you very much still need the human expertise, not only to provide oversight for the outliers, the algorithm is going to throw up, and to prevent biased decision making, but it's actually an imperative if you want to maintain your culture and your public reputation. 
So I shared um, my top tips on how to ensure you're successful with AI, but now I want to spend some time thinking on achieving profound transformation because profound transformation goes beyond an acceptance criteria that the data team sets out. It goes beyond data accuracy. My argument for achieving profound transformation from ML is that your acceptance criteria should take into consideration your strategic vision for machine learning within the organization. It's not enough just to say that our run was successful. You need to think about how it plays into what the overall strategy of the organization is. So there are three key pillars that I think are crucial to achieving profound transformation. And the first is setting a vision for the future. So you need to set this bold vision for the future in five to 10 years. What do you want to be known for? How can you play to your strengths? How can you disrupt the marketplace? And then you want to take a step back and explore how machine learning can contribute towards this vision for the future. And then off the back of that, you then define what the short term initiatives are that will get you closer to the future vision. So you ensure that you're using machine learning in a strategic way, that it is contributing towards the overall objective of your organization. And it's not just ML for the sake of ML. Next, we've got executive buy-in. And the reason I've included this is because so many uh, organizations get caught in a proof of concept loop or get caught with just one or two algorithms in production because they struggle to get buy-in from the executive team. And this is absolutely crucial if you want to scale your ML algorithms across the organization and set up a program of work that's going to achieve real transformation. So you need to show the business value that ML can deliver. You need to have a business case for it. But you also need to highlight the measures taken to minimize the risk of failure. I've shared some examples of what happens when ML goes wrong. And the exec are going to be considering this when they're deciding whether to implement ML and whether to go live with it because they are going to be risk averse. They're going to be concerned about what happens if they get their names dragged into the headlines. And lastly, for this exec buy-in, which I think is often overlooked, is the need to educate the exec. 45% of executives, uh, only so only 45% of executives have said that they're confident in their own digital skills and ability to lead the organization in the digital economy. So, take the time to provide, provide a foundational knowledge to your exec team so that they can make informed decisions about the application of machine learning across the organization so that they feel empowered about how machine learning is gonna be used to help them achieve that strategic vision. And the third one um, that I wanted to mention is the cultural impact. And I have explored this in more detail on the other slides and I've emphasized the importance of getting that employee buy-in upfront to prevent an exodus and prevent um, negative brand perception. And the best way to do that is to take a very user-centric approach. So go to the end users on day one, whether they're back office or their customers, and understand what their pain points are and how you could use machine learning to deliver value to those people. And then what you want to do is map out the 2B process and overlay how human expertise is going to provide value add with the algorithm and alongside the algorithm. And that will make them feel like they've contributed towards this process. You've listened to what they need and you are helping them out by delivering ML um, in this way. And, and the flip side for you is that you can utilize their expertise to enable ongoing supervision of the algorithm. And this is needed in order to embed this enduring culture of change. So you want to get to the point where you have different areas of the business flagging where they think that there are potential efficiency gains that could be achieved with machine learning. And that will only be achieved if you take this user-centric approach. So I would argue that without the exec buy-in and the cultural impact, it is impossible to achieve your vision for the future. So that's why I focus on these three pillars because I think they are of critical importance. So I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes uh, reflecting on what the work we do at Emergence and how we support organizations to achieve profound transformation machine learning. So at Emergence, we aim to make the world a better place to live and work. And we do this by helping organizations to achieve efficient gains and long lasting impact with new and emerging tech. And we, that's why we have this tagline of profound transformation. We don't want to just support with one 
um, project with new and emerging tech we want to help you on your journey to achieving that bold vision for the future and we understand that new and emerging tech particularly ai is an enabler for that vision for the future so how do we do this? How do we deliver profound transformation in machine learning? Uh, we've got two key offerings uh, that I'd like to take you through. The first is a tech diagnostic. So this is an offering that's a, really targeted at organizations who are partway through their AI journey and potentially struggling to get the value they want to get out of machine learning and this, or they're struggling to get the cultural buy-in or the exec buy-in. And what we'll do is we'll do a review of how machine learning has been implemented to date and we'll help your organization to reset. So we'll set that bold vision for the future. We'll think about how ML is going to help you achieve it. And we'll build in best practices and governance for designing ML models so that you can deliver them in an ethical manner and have the confidence that you're going to del deliver value added outputs to your users and deliver the ROI that you outlined in your business case to your exec. And the second offering that we have is embedding service design. So I've highlighted throughout this talk about the importance of taking this human centric approach. And I cannot overstate it enough. I think it's one of the main reasons that AI projects fail is because they don't have enough uh, of this human centric approach embedded into the process. So this offering is all about ingraining this ethical people centric uh, approach to ML upfront with an organization. So we tend to do this with organizations which, who are a bit newer to AI or trying to ensure that they do it in a very ethical manner from the get go and that they've got this roadmap to take it into production. And we'll consider how best to optimize human expertise and machine learning. And we'll really think about how to deliver that lasting, lasting value and to support the cultural shift that's needed in order to drive adoption of machine learning across the organization. So if you would like to find out more, please do get in touch with me at katie at emergencehq.com. Uh, we have a whole range of other offerings within our consulting framework, which I would be delighted to share with you as well. Uh, but for now, all that remains is for me to say thank you so much for joining my talk this afternoon. I hope it's been insightful um, and that you've got some key takeaways on how to avoid some of these common pitfalls and to sit in that 15% of AI projects which are successful. Thank you very much and hopefully I'll speak to you all soon.